Just to remember praying that if we can just have one car in my family. Yeah. And you had to flee. <laughs> Fortunate people. Mm. Mm. I was engaged mm. and was left with a two day old baby. Which lawyer processed your rough? Was it your dad? <laughs> There are women who went through what I do and they were not able to bounce back. Lacking options is what makes us fall into these traps. You can't allow this Sumjolo thing to get in the way of, uh, of life. And I think that's what's made relationshiping difficult. And that's also one legacy of apartheid. Yeah. Uh, that really messed us up. Did she have a license to sell liquor? She was a hoarder of note. Uh, how did his passing on affect you? Sure. 2013 was the most difficult day of my life. Just talk with DJ Cappuccino. Need to refresh and unwind? Come to Wild Things at Meropa Casino and Conference Center where you get to enjoy quad bags, swimming pools, water park, restaurants, kids games, reptile park, camping, birds park, and many other activities. Sort of just talk with DJ Cappuccino. I'm with Sepp Matabate, an internationally certified image consultant and award-winning entrepreneur, founder of House of Impression, which is an image consulting firm. Tsepo has won a number of awards, including Male and Guardian Power of Women 2021, Thriving Network Top 50 Female Founders in South Africa 2019. Tsepo holds various uh, responsibilities, among them non-executive board representation, Health Professional Council of South Africa. Limpopo Connection, state-owned company, Women Industrializing Africa, Limpopo United Business Forum, Limpopo Sports Confederation Women's Award. Where's water? These things I have many. There are a lot. <laughs> Women Economic Assembly, Concord Young Women in Business, uh, Business Women Association of South Africa. You know, I didn't even mention the title and what she does there. I think I'm, and I'm hoping that as we move, she'll be able to explain. Welcome to Just Talk with DJ Capacino. You know, Tsepo, you hey, can relax, don't Cappuccino. worry much about the mic. They're going to pick you all very well. Hey, Cappuccino hey, and everybody out there. Yeah. I'm happy to be here. I'm glad you're here. You know, having you here is, I mean, I'm having a sister. I'm having a friend. Gore, this doesn't even feel like uh, a podcast interview. Sure. I feel like we're just chilling at home and enjoying the cookies that you bake so well. <laughs> from, uh, tea, two o'clock, right? Tea That's o'clock. right. Yeah. And Tsepo is one of those people, hard, uh, you know that she'll bring something very nice. She brought us uh, biscuits and cookies, which uh, will come when my coffee arrives. Thank you very much. Always a pleasure. I was raised by Bakhekolo, you know, yeah. and uh, you don't go empty-handed, Moyangon, yeah. especially if there's something at your house that you have extra. Yeah. So, you know, we are not given these things in abundance for no reason. Do you have you know? money extra in the safe? Always. And you forgot to bring. <laughs> yeah, we'll appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you. But Tepo, you know, you are one active woman. And you've been active for a long time. I think I've known you and I met you, I think, 20, 25 years ago. You've been running, always working on something. But I want us to go back uh, to that little girl. You know, where you grew up, that family structure. Uh, if there are fondest memories, you can uh, maybe think of also share them with us. We just want that little girl, Tsep. Sure. I was raised by very powerful women. Mm. I grew up, uh, spent a lot of time, my formative years, Rapasha. Uh, that's my mother's home village. Mm-hmm. My mom is from a royal family, so from the time you wake up in the morning, there's traffic at the gate. Oh. So my grandmother was solving problems all day. Mm. And that's the life that I remember. And my grandmother and grandfather would sit on the stoop drinking tea yeah. from lemons picked in the backyard and honey that my grandfather went to go and harvest in their garden. Wow. So I grew up in a very loving environment mm. where the women were very dynamic and very powerful but also very humble. Mm. And my grandmother never sat down. Her name was Pilad. She was on her feet the whole That's you. day. That's you. Yeah. Pilad was on her feet the whole day. 
Obatsora in the morning and she would bath and look very beautiful. Wore beautiful dresses. And she would get down to business. Breakfast, lunch, supper, snacks in between. She stands up and she goes and prepares a meal. So that's that's where I that's where I go back to myself. Wow. Wow. And my grandfather, my, my father's, my paternal family. My grandmother was a cattle farmer. And Leanna, from the time she woke up, and every morning, she's already awake, so I don't even know what time she woke up. And she would wake up and make mareu from Kamulajawa the previous night. And she would go Aramimasi from a, a cow. Fresh. Fresh. And she would make mareu for everybody. Some of us will die not having had fresh milk. Imagine. <laughs> yeah. So Matladi would go arame maasui and prepare breakfast for everybody. Mm. And then from there she goes into her fields and she plows. Mm. Feed for her cattle. And also she had fruit trees in her yard. And she would harvest mm. so that you can snack during the day while you're sitting under the tree. Wow. From there she would sit alore marora adi plastic. Everybody, anybody who knows my grandmother is that she threw nothing away. She was a hoarder of note. And she would make these rugs that we'd sit on that were made from recycled plastics. So her hands never, were never still. Yeah. Our nana go chill. Never. Chill. <laughs> never. Lately people just chill. <laughs> yeah. So these are the women that um, I grew up, you know, um, with. And I think they're my biggest influence. Wow. Then you have my own mother, who was a professional teacher. I lost to go and stock up at the bottle store and sell. Did she have a license to sell liquor? She had a license to sell liquor. Oh, my dad was a lawyer, so. <laughs> yeah. My dad was a lawyer, so everything you do has got to be above board because then it comes back to his name. And I think that's another thing. My father valued his name more than anything in the world. Like by then, you are still Khapasha, right? No, no, no. Mm. Um, I would go and visit my grandparents. Mm. But because my parents had such busy schedules, we spent almost every weekend either at my mother's, at my, at my maternal home or my paternal home. Mm. So I'm talking weekends and school holidays. Mm. Um, I was born 1983. And my mother was a professional teacher by then, and my father was in his last year of law at the University of Limpopo. Oh, yeah. So my father started, my mother started working before my father. Mm. And uh, I spent the first four years of my life in both my mother's uh, family, while my dad and my mother were sorting out their professional lives. Mm. And then from there, we moved to Daviton, where I did my preschooling. I went to Lisedi, um Preschool in Daviton. My mother was a teacher at Davy High, and my father was serving articles. Mm. And my father was serving articles in Benoni, at a, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a law firm. So I spent a couple of years there. And um, when the schools, the Model C schools, opened up for Black okay, learners, just a second. Eh? Sure. Just go to Energy FM. Tell them to do that. Eh? And when the Model C schools opened up for black learners, I was enrolled at Dominican Convent, which is in Belgravia, downtown Johannesburg. Oh, that's where you got the twig, right? Yeah, yeah. Like <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. and I think the transition from uh, village life to township to urban wasn't an easy one. But because I was young, I think I was fairly pliable. So I don't have any horrible memories. But I do remember, you know... Um, the shock of having to remind yourself to flush the toilet. Oh, because you were used to... Yeah. Long drop. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. So later in life, you realize that some of us encounter this transition as adults. So you can imagine, you're not as pliable as a six-year-old. It's true. No, no, now it makes sense, sorry, uh, how other people, adults will behave. And you can see or like... These are things that the person has been used to for, for many years. Absolutely. It's not easy to, to, to get rid of them. Definitely, definitely. Mm. Then um, overachiever from the get-go. My mom keeps all my certificates of merit and my prizes and all of that. So 
I've got a book, a Pinocchio book that I won in grade one for being the top learner at Dominican Convent. Yeah. And um, by then, you must remember, it's my first year doing English and Kitsaba Spedi Fela. So I don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. Mm. So um, I look back on that and I think um, it was intentional, you know, on my parents' side to support me or create an environment that ensures that I thrive. So, um, yeah, like I said, my mom keeps everything. The other day I came across a certificate from when uh, we moved to Pulukwane and I went to PEMPS. And when I was in Standard Fire, I was, I was head of fundraising at uh, PEMPS. Yeah. And I was running the tuck shop. Mm -hmm. So my relationship with uh, handling money and um, understanding how to allocate resources really goes uh, way back. Mm -hmm. So um, what does school holidays look like for us? School holidays, we were not forced, but I developed an interest in how the business is operated. And any friend of mine will tell you that come school holidays, you know, we pack our bags and we go to the village to my grandmother's house and we go and work at the bottle store or the hardware. Yeah. Or at the filling station. And you're selling petrol, you're selling window frames, and uh, you're selling the Gordons. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. You don't get <laughs> Sepa, everything. Oh, love, oh, mm. love, yeah. So those are my fondest memories. And I think I remember the female figures in our family because the men were mainly, were mostly away from, you know, the homestead. Yes. Mm. That's, that's also one legacy of apartheid. Yeah. Uh, that really messed us up. Absolutely, mm. absolutely. Mm. So yeah, those are my fondest memories. And also I remember playing Dibeke with uh, my cousins who lived in and around the village, and we'd play, you know, at my house. I seldom got to go and play with other kids at their homes. All the kids used to come to, you know, my house. So I but don't they know. they would get food. <laughs> I they don't would... know what it was. No, I can assume. <laughs> they would get, get fruits. They would get something. Uh, I understand that, that scenario. I think I grew up around yeah. similar, more or less the same. Yeah. Sure, sure. So, mm. yes, I played with um, a lot of boys growing up, you know, a lot of uh, the friendships that I developed in my formative years were with male figures. So, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's really wonderful to, to, to look back and uh, it just warms my heart yeah. that, you know, those are the footprints that will never be wiped away from, wow. you know, my journey. Okay, then um, now we, we're looking at like this girl who now start to have a lot of career paths in her mind. You want to develop yourself. Like there's a certain route you want to take. You're trying this. It works. This doesn't work. You're trying to figure things out. You know, those years where, whether it's education, whether it's whatever, that young temple now mm. beginning to want to secure the future. You know, I've always been one to live in the moment. So there was never a time where I was planning my career. I started thinking about what I'm going to study in December of 2001 when I matriculated after I received my results. Mm. And the default course to study was law because my dad was an attorney. And I think um, enrolling at the University of Pretoria to study law was, it was sheer default. Mm. And I did law for the first six months. I said, mm -mm, this is not connecting. It's not you. I don't want to. And remember, my exposure then of a lawyer was somebody who's in litigation. And I resented that process because I'd sometimes go to court with my dad. And I didn't like the environment. And sometimes it's tedious. It takes long. Yes. Some cases you even wonder whether they competed or not. Absolutely. And I mean, at times there were threats on his life and things like that. And I felt, but this is not my path. Mm. I sat down with my parents and they understood. They were very accommodating. I said, you know what, I want to go and study psychology. I want to understand how the human mind works. Okay. At that time, I was a volunteer at the Center for Study of AIDS at the University of Pretoria. And we're doing a lot of outreach programs in the townships in and around Pretoria, um, trying to you know, curb the scourge of HIV then, because it was declared a pandemic. Konja, when was it? Which 2002. Yeah. And we were doing outreach, and I loved that. I loved creating and curating the, um, the awareness campaigns and, you know, starting to understand, you know, um, the dynamics that involved how people get to contract and manage the disease and also going out with a message of hope 
for those who are living with the disease. Yes. And I think I got drawn into that world and immediately I enrolled for a course during our break uh, with Demelin on events and uh, conference management, events and uh, exhibition management. Mm. And I learned how to um, curate and manage events, how to budget, all of that. My lecturer was Wendy. She was a part-time lecturer. Um, and, you know, we'd have coffees uh, outside of the lecture hall. And I got interested in that world. And she started linking me with mentors in the space mm. who would share why they do what they do. And I found that to be more closer to where I wanted to be. Yes. So I was studying psychology and I was doing events on the side. In 2003, I was involved in a very bad car accident. Uh, and sorry, sorry. I, yeah, you know, and um, I was uh, hospitalized for some time and I came home for recovery and I never went back to Pretoria. So with my... You never went to complete... I would never went to complete the psychology. I was doing a second year by then. Yeah. And you, you can have the water. I don't know. You're going oh, to have thank it you. Spanzola or what? Yes, can please. I also have water? Can somebody open it for me, please? When there are I'll gentlemen in the room, you don't lift a finger, ladies. <laughs> thank you so yeah. much. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I know you are a person of etiquette. And then, <laughs> you know, when you came in, I apologized to her. There are so many things we are going to do wrong. Mara, I know that you're going to, to, to suggest to Rebecca Young in future. We live and learn. Yeah. So I then um, start. But, uh, uh -huh. so, sorry, before you go there. Sure. Did, how did it uh, maybe affect you, the fact that mm. now you can't go back to mm. finish what you've started, which is. It's not so much that I couldn't go back, but I also didn't want to go back. Um, I, I had injury. Oh, yeah, I, I did go back for about two months, but I couldn't um, sit for a very long time. And, you know, we'd have eight-hour lectures. And the doctor said, you need to give yourself time to recover. Otherwise, you're going to battle because I had injuries on my back and neck. So that's a very sensitive area. So the doctor said, uh-uh. You've got to take it easy, otherwise we won't have a full recovery. Which which lawyer processed your rough? Was it your dad? <laughs> no comment. <laughs> oh. In fact, my question was, did you process rough? At least I got the answer. Yeah. No, there was no such claim. There was no there were there were no rough claims because I think my dad knew better. Mm. Um I think um yeah, we'll 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 come to that. Okay. But, yeah, so the doctor essentially recommended that, you know what, give yourself time to recover. You'll go back once you have recovered in full. And because I was a, a driven somebody, I wanted to do a thing and finish. But I gave myself time. And in that time that I was at home in Polokwane with my parents and my siblings, you know, my siblings would have to use, like, um, common transport to get to school and things like that. And I felt like, but... That's a life I lived and I don't want it for my siblings. Yes. So I started transporting my siblings to school. The one was in high school up in Mahobaskluf and the one was uh, in school here in town. Every morning? Every morning I dropped my brother off at school and I would take my sister to, sc uh, to school on Monday and collect her on Friday. She was a weekly Mahobas boarder. School? What school is that? Yeah, Stanford Lake College. Oh, Stanford. That one? That one. <laughs> Oh, you're out of order. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So every Friday I would go and fetch my sister and Mondays go and uh, drop her off. And then in the mornings I would drop my brother off at school and then, you know, collect him. And I got to connect with them and start understanding how to support them. Because, you know, when you're the firstborn, you don't have a big brother or big sister yeah. and you kind of wing it. And I felt like, wow, I don't want them to figure things out whereas I've walked some of these paths. Mm. So let me be present. And I can tell you those three years that I was um, here with my family, I got to bond with them and I realized that I didn't know them. Mm. You know, um, and I think right now that was the biggest investment that I made in my, not only myself, but in our unit as a family. And I think my presence here brought the family together. Oh, yeah. Because I now, because now I've got like this events background, I would curate experiences. So every family holiday was planned by me. So who, whose car were you using to transport them? Oh, 
Um, oh, there was always a fleet at home. My dad was a car fanatic. So at any given time, there are five cars in the, in the yard and, you know, you pick the one that is not being used. You know, I used to remember praying that if we can just have one car in my family. Yeah. And we had the fleet. <laughs> Fortunate people. Mm. Mm. <laughs> so whatever car is in the yard, you know, you, you get that and you, you're able to, to mobilize. And I think also my parents didn't have attachments to their things. Oh, yeah. So there was no papa's car, mama's car, you know, it's transport. And you were <laughs> Yeah, no. <laughs> there was none of that. So whatever car is there, you started and, you know, life mm. gets going. So a car has always been a form of transport. So I think even now I've never really obsessed about the kind of car that I'm driving because it really is just that it's a form of transport. I've driven, you know, my dream car when I didn't know it was, you know, my dream car. And, you know, so I got over it very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I would curate family experiences and I started getting requests from people outside the family for me to create experiences for them. Were you and the one suggesting overseas trips? Yes, actually. Oh, they were there. Yes. Mm. No, no, definitely. <laughs> um, I think my dad was the type of, per my parents rather, were if an opportunity comes, they take it. Mm. I think I went overseas for the very first time in high school. Early high school, there was a trip to Europe. We did um, UK, France, and Italy. And uh, my parents paid for it, and I went with uh, kids from around the country. Mm. Um, I think we were two from my school, and others were from um, other schools from Cape Town, Joburg, and so on. And that was my first overseas trip by myself with a group of friends. And, you know, you're thrown in the deep end in a foreign country, and it was, uh, it was beautiful. So the traveling has always been a part of the family. Um, my father would have um, a year-end function around the 16th of every year for his clients and all that. And then from the 20th or so, we'd be on holiday until just before New Year's. So we'd 20th? 20th of December, 20th, 21st, or 22nd latest. And then we'd come back the 29th or 30th so that we can spend New Year's with my grandmother, his when mother. When we are selling sweets at the taxi <laughs> ranks, you guys are on holiday. <laughs> My life is well. Wow. <laughs> Don't okay. put it like that. No, no, honestly. Yeah. Yeah, so we'd come back 29th, 30th, buy fireworks, buy bry meat, and we were maragala to my paternal grandmother. Mm. And, you know, my father is a typical bumma kind of guy. So this bumma thing, I've never heard. Riagai. Yeah. And we'd spend time with uh, the people in the neighborhood and the family. Oh, so like you call everyone. Now. Everyone. Now it's no longer yes. your, only your family. No, no, no. Now it's everybody, you know. Mm. And then from there, we'd go and relieve the staff at, you know, our, our various businesses so they can also get to see their families. Until schools open and then, you know, life goes on. <clears throat> so, yeah, that's, um, that's, that's what would happen. But um, getting to connect with my siblings um, has created this bond that ensures that nothing can come between us. Oh, yes. Because we have seen every side of, it, of, of each other. You know, at our most vulnerable, we, we, we've been through the most uh, together, and we know to stick together. So I know at any given time, you know, my brother, my sister is on my speed dial. And even now, if I can't go and fetch my son from school, my brother goes. I don't even have to ask. Sometimes he just volunteers, says, hey, I'll get him today. Mm -hmm. So we've got that kind of relationship, and it comes from that period where I was confined to um, Bulukwani uh, post my accident. Mm -hmm. And ever since, my learning culture has been that I learn what I need to know, and you know, even if I enroll, if, even if I enroll for the course, I don't do it for the graduation or for the certificate or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's about acquiring the knowledge and finding places to express it. Or even now where I'm at, I identify, okay, what do I need to know to do better? That I will enroll in a course, you know, do it. And then I don't know if I've ever attended any of my graduations. I did end up completing you got your knowledge, of qualifications. That's it. Yes. Yeah. Because it's never been about that. I remember when we were in matric, people had were given cars and parties. And, you know, my dad just shook my hand and said, congratulations. <laughs> you can drive my jeans. Oh, well, we had been drive. I'd been I'd been driving prior to getting my license, because of circumstances. Yeah, you broke the law. Yeah. 
for your law breaker. <laughs> well. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we were exposed to some of these responsibilities a little bit earlier because, you know, you had the responsibility of running the shop and there are times where you'd have to travel and the car is there, but there's no driver. So you hop in and you go. No, you can't justify it. <laughs> you were just having disregard of beautiful <laughs> South African laws. <laughs> now and then. Yeah. 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 So um, then uh, I started... Um, studying the climate in Polokwane. Mm. Um, you know, my peers were still in school by then, you know, completing their studies. Can you recall which year? Because I want us to go, you know, um, move together on this one. Yeah. 2006? Mm. 2005, 2006? I think that's, that's the time I met you because that's when I came full-time sure, for Polokwane. Yeah. Sure, 2005, 2006. Yeah. Then 2007, I started engaging my family to say, look, I think I actually want to pursue this business thing. You know, yes, I've been helping in the family business, but I feel like there's something else that I want to do. Mm -hmm. So 2007, I started my own business on my own. And uh, that's where Flair Events was born. And yeah. I was um, doing events for, I think my first big break was an NC event. And we worked, you know, we got to be <coughs> fed. Uh, to come do sound stage. Yeah. Uh, I still remember. We collaborated When, quite when a I lot. saw your call, I knew money's coming. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I remember one of the first things that my father um, sat down to tell me is that, look, there are two ways of doing business. Mm. One will get you in trouble and one will make sure that you build a solid foundation for your kids to continue with what yes. you have started. Yes. And I've done my best to make sure that I chose the latter. Mm. You know, so when... The water started getting murky. I stepped away from doing business with certain institutions because I could not you, play is, by those Is it rules. including ANC? Look, I still do business with uh, the ANC, albeit limited. Um, but yeah, the, the water started getting really, really murky. And uh, it became difficult to do business in the way that I wanted to. It's true. So I stepped aside and you, you let things be. Um, also in terms of government as well, there were times where it was, you know, easy to get, not easy, but, you know, you're getting the business because they believe you can do the job best. Exactly and, my sentiments. Tip. And then, you know, you, you, you'd work in peace. And where when you submit the invoice, you receive the full payment and you use discretion as to how that money is spent. But now it, that it, it came to a point where it comes with terms and conditions. Besides, but we were mainly doing that. Yeah. And we could all get business. I mean, yeah. I'll break it down from one event. There will be flyers, yeah. a deal for posters. There will be a deal for uh, corporate banners and yeah. everything. A deal for sound. Yeah. A deal for stage. They would break those things up. And then all of us will get something. Something. Mama Wota will get this. Yeah. We will get this. Mm. And someone tempered with that system, Tsepa. That made us to start podcasting now. Yeah. On an on an, on an, uh, on a hungry stomach. Mm. If it wasn't for the cookies you brought, I don't know what we would have eaten today. <laughs> but my point is that somebody tempered with that system that used to support many people. Because many people who start to take their siblings to school, yeah. we knew that a, a month would not pass without an order year. Yes. And you wonder who's getting those things now. Yeah, and I think um, it then requires us to create a generational mission to ensure inclusivity in economic activity. Mm. So for me, that's where my activism came from, to say but it was easier to do business under certain circumstances, and it was open for all. As long as you had built a little capacity, there was room for you to go and flex your muscle. Yes. So now, even with the capacity, there are no opportunities for you. So where did we go wrong? And we must start fixing that. And um, that's when I decided to get into the advocacy side of business to say, okay, mm. how do we remedy the situation? Because Forums. we can't sustain these trends yes. that are detrimental to the health of our society. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. The politics, I would like to believe that you are <coughs> active in politics from branch level. Of the ANC. You sound DA though. 
I think. <laughs> what does that mean? No, most DA leaders. <laughs> I think DA, they would have chosen you for something. The twang and everything and how you express yourself and all that. You know, you're not sounding, uh, Comrade, we are dealing with this matter. <laughs> this matter. And all that. But what influenced the politics? Where is this thing coming from? Um, I was approached uh, around 2006, um, you know, to the local branch of the ANC. Look, we see what you're doing. Can you come and do it with or for us? And I attended my first meeting, and in that meeting, I was elected <laughs> to <laughs> to be See, part of the, uh, the the executive committee. So you get recruited, you get elected at <laughs> same time. <laughs> so um, I then started participating and starting to understand what the role of politics in um, the bigger scheme of things. Yeah, and I I developed an interest in um, you know why are there no women in the room. A lot of the time, I'd find that. I'm the only woman in the room. And of course, it's an uncomfortable place to be. So I made it, you know, my mission to go and recruit other women to say, look, let there be two, three, four, five of us so that, you know, you can breathe easy. So I started understanding the dynamics to say, you know, even when there's an event, mm -hmm. you know, the guys buy, you know, alcohol, uh, buy drinks for themselves. There's Those no... friends of... Yes. 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 And like, whiskey. Hey, I'm like, hello. Where's that sparkling wine? Yes. And yeah. where's, you know, the tea and all of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I suppose I'm the only one who would be, you know, in a club at 11 o'clock and asking for tea. But, you know, it is what it is, you know. You've never taken here. alcohol, Zappo? I don't take alcohol. You've never tried? Never tried. Wheat? No. I Nothing. drink it. I drink it as a tea. As a tea? Yeah. Growing up, my grandmother would give us clare. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, now that we're older, she even gave us plants. Uh, my grandmother, Mania Mamaga. Mm -hmm. And she gives us plants. And we all have a plant in the backyard. And you pick a few leaves, you boil and uh, you have it with honey and lemon, and you go sleep. Peacefully. Peacefully. Okay. <laughs> Never nice. smoked it. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I drink tea at like one o'clock in the morning in a club. I'm, I'm that girl. Mm. So, um, yeah, so you start seeing the gaps. And you're like, but no, we need to fix this. And once you're in there, you realize, okay, but it's a process to fix this thing. It's not an overnight thing. Yeah. So you get deeper and deeper into the issues and you pick a corner and you mend that corner. And that's what's uh, been happening in the activism space. What, what, what are the challenges that comes with being uh, a young, beautiful female um, in politics? Sure. The challenges that come, I believe they, they could be one or two that you have overcame, you know. What are those? Um, look, when you are in a space where men are dominating, all of them develop an interest in you. But all 12 of them in that executive committee, and you're like, but what is this? I didn't come here for that. So you learn to and, and, and accept... And some, when you reject them, it's egos. They feel bruised, like... Yes, yeah. yes. So I had to learn to assert myself very, very early to say, oh, look, so you develop a certain posture and mannerism that sends a message before you even open your mouth. Bravo, and I, you are wasting time. To, proper. So um, I started moving with older women. I think by virtue of the spaces that I was in, I got exposed to wisdom very, very early. And a, a lot of, I, I can say they're called coaches and mentors now. Those who but, paid the price. Yes, we'll tell you, Ray, be careful of this thing, this thing, this thing. Don't allow this, 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 mm. that. So you had those um, warnings from people that had walked the journey and I'm glad that I heeded their advice because I think I would be in a different place had I conceded to certain advances. Mm -hmm. So the biggest um, threat for any young woman in, in business or in, uh, in, in politics is that everybody's going to declare their undying love for you in an, in an effort to try and manage your views. Oh, manage, they want to, yes. manage your comrade. Mm -hmm. So it's about, you know... Um, uh, you know, getting influence over you so that you have their voice ringing in your mind and you end up abandoning your own views because we are wired to nurture and, you know, submission and that whole thing, how we're socialized. Yes. You do it so well. Yeah. So mm. you, you, fall, you can't fall prey to those things. So you just need to be wary of them. And like I said, you've got to learn to assert yourself, yeah. you know, very early so that people know how to approach you. Without mentioning names, um, obviously there are 
ladies that you saw being destroyed by not being careful, especially in that space, where they can uh, draw the line, where they can, where they get confused. And some, it's also from genuine interest, you know, because I, I know that in politics you meet very smart guys. Yes. Influential guys, people who can make things happen, mm. people who can even see things uh, uh, beyond what the eye can see. Yeah. And they can charm anyone, anytime. And I believe that you've seen some who've committed those mistakes and you wondered like maybe how you could have actually intervened and everything. I think also these things happen in the dark where you don't see them. So a oh, lot you only of, see the results. You only see the results. Um, so they happen very in a very, very hidden way. It's mm. not... So you'll see the results and... If you are approached, it's to intervene and rescue. You know, it's a rescue mission. Hey, you, are um, you are collecting the pieces. Now. Yes. And uh, it's unfortunate that we don't have enough of these conversations, even as women, to sort of look, guys, um, <laughs> this is the reality of the situation. Hey. So you've got to pick your, you know, your battles very, very wisely. Mm. I think one of the ladies that, um, you know, who, who spoke to us was that, you know, so every man is going to love you. And that's just how they greet you. So you mustn't take it to heart. It's men, Mara, we have problems. Man. You know, so yeah. when you are me and you are taking decisions of national importance, you can't allow this Mjolo thing to get in the way of, uh, of life. And I think that's what's made relationship difficult as well. Because yes. when you meet somebody, you, you, you're always... Wondering, you know, why are they here? What are they trying to? So it makes you a little bit paranoid as well. Lerena, having someone who's in the political space, it's, um, you know, mm. maybe we're still busy with uh, Brian's meeting. And yeah. You, and it's uh, other things. Okay, baby. Mm. It's 10 o'clock. Mm. Check the watches. Yeah. You call at half past 12. She answers immediately. Mm. Baby, we're still in the meeting. Mm. <laughs> Look. Um, and... and <laughs> For some reason, someone is tired, there is yawning. You know? mm. Mm. Uh, look, some unfortunate things do happen. And I don't think uh, they happen in politics only. It's, it's universal, even in business. Mm. And um, it's just about what values have been instilled in you mm. and how well do you uphold them. And those are the conversations we're not having. Because I we like have that. normalized... I like that. We have yeah. normalized that conduct you know, where people are not shy to ask you for a bribe and to want to take you into the sheets. And we've encouraged it. We enable it. Mm. So you you need to develop a posture where you know that people can't approach you with those kind of offers. Because people are smart. They'll study you. Mm. And they'll establish, okay, this is, you know, the, where the gap is and I can enter through there. So... What has worked for me is having a tribe of people around me so that we're able to talk to these things. We're able to talk about them openly and freely so that you know how to manage the situation even when you're most vulnerable. Yes. Because also yes. the timing of how you're approached, mm. you know, will also inform um, your level of vulnerability. Mm. So it's, it's, it's about creating those spaces where you're able to share any and everything so that when... The, especially the young women, when they go out, mm. they are well armed and they know that they've got a plan B. And I think lacking options is what makes us fall into these traps. Don't you discuss that in the women's league or something? I'm, I'm very intentional about the conversations that I have. So in my little way, I'm intentional about driving the message home that, you know what, these are the pitfalls of going this route. Um, I mean, I, I, was, uh, I was engaged mm. and was left with a two-day-old baby. Uh. Yes. Even with my background, I couldn't take a better decision. Is the guy still around? No. He's no more. I'm a single parent. No, I mean, he's no more. still alive. Hopefully. I would have that's, heard. That's, that's how bad it that's is. That's how bad it is. So... For me, it's about educating young women to avoid going the route that I went. Was so it a imagine, person in politics? No, 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 no. I've stayed away from those ones. 
I'm just I'm just trying to yeah. understand. No, no. I've I've, I've intentionally two years old and you, you, yeah. you leave. Two day, two days. Two so days. two days. Yes, I just come back from the hospital and he just stopped coming to visit us. So we 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 make these mistakes, and how you recover is key. And if I did not have alternative ways of looking after myself and my baby, I would have been in trouble. Had I been dependent on him financially, I wouldn't be where I am now. So for me, the message is to every woman, take decisions from an informed and empowered version of yourself wow. so that you are able to recover from these things. There are women who went through what I do and they were not able to bounce back. They are still not able to feed their children. They are in abusive relationships because if I leave, I'm going to starve and my children are going to starve. So my message is to women, be as self-reliant as possible because then these kind of things, when they happen, it's not a catastrophe. Develop yourself. Develop yourself. Empower yourself. Be in a position where you can take, choose a route that honors you. And, and, and it's true, uh, which is a fact. Uh, many people or many women who are in relationships because there's, there's no way to go. It's thinking that if I live here, I'm leaving shelter, I'm leaving everything, and there's nothing I can do. Yeah. And they have to endure this abuse, which is even systematic and doesn't stop and it escalates and everything. And they live amongst us. Yeah. They come with their beautiful nails, nice handbags, beautiful cars, but they cry every day. And I think it's even worse in the rural areas where it's normalized. Just but we yesterday, have a lot of issues. In we have a lot of challenges to resolve, mm. and until we are honest about what the solutions are, we're not going to get over them. I mean, we've got gender-based violence and femicide, as declared a pandemic, you know, in a democratic country where we're mm. able to speak openly about issues, mm. why are we not being frank in our discussions in terms of what the solution is here? Mm. And, and I think as men, we're not having the necessary conversations about that. The perpetrators, we don't. Uh, we, we, we actually, uh, this thing is brewed from our young age as boys. Mm. Why will a PSD? Mm. You know, those things, and it escalates, it goes, it becomes something, then you grow with that. The person that you are in love with, that you're with, is now your property. Yeah. Must do, dress, talk the way you want. Yeah. You understand? And such things continue and con it's becoming a, a visual cycle. I think as men... Uh, we need this really on a real sense of weight. We need this men's conference yeah, to, to address these issues. And then also to reprove each other. Like, for instance, there are men, people that you know that this person is abusing himself. Yeah. Yeah. You know it. And it's easy for you to share a glass of whiskey or something. Mm. But you can't say... This should stop, and I think accountability. Our relationship, yeah. Yes, accountability and mm. putting up boundaries, even among each other. For example, um, the women in my circle, mm. I would never allow myself to enable an abusive situation. Yes. Every woman that comes into you know my space, I want to know how are you making money, because that is always the first. That is the first block. question. Like, yes. How do you sustain yourself? How are you making money? Oh, you're not making money? What are what? you able to do? Are you aware that you can do X, Y, Z? And we make the necessary connections so that you are able to be See, economically that, that's active. That's very powerful. I'm telling you. That is, that, that, those are the first basic questions you should ask each other, especially as women. Because that is one source of abuse. Yeah. A woman who can do anything for herself. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So anybody who knows me will find that maybe I'm probing you too much. But my intention is to make sure that you're in a safe space. Because hug and the weather and how have you been? So what do you, you know, how are the kids? And those don't help us. Nice so, bag. Yes, you know. So I want to know, so what do you do? And I think this is the first question I ask any woman that I meet. So what do you do? And she, if she can't tell me what she does, 
then I know already there's a problem here. So we need to have a follow-up session or I need to dedicate another 10 minutes to this conversation. So that when she walks away, she has a plan. So, but that's oh. a ministry already. And then I want to encourage you to, to really continue. But I know you, you're you one organized. You can make someone meet someone. That I know for sure. I think it's something that uh, should not be done from a casual level of things. If possible, like make it. And it's something that should also, even those who are listening uh, to this podcast, to look at how do you improve each other's lives, especially as women. And that is the real empowerment. And it's going to sort solve a lot of problems and also reduce GBV. Absolutely. And also there's, there's also a misconception that, you know, uh, because I'm pro-women, I'm anti-men. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> when when you, 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 you friends with my wife and yeah. you start to say, no, you can't tolerate this nonsense. You need to start doing things for yourself. Yeah. You become the enemy. Yes. It's not like, uh, I don't really like that girl's help. Mm. Why? No, I heard something about her. Mm. I won't tell you. Mm-hmm. You must stop talking to her. Yeah. Then I start to uh, isolate you from you being developed. Yeah. Mm. So, you know, being pro-women is not anti-men. Mm. In fact, we make sure that we are so good for ourselves that we'll be great for you. Oh, man. Wisdom. Wow. That's the intention. We make better wives, better mothers. Mm. When we're empowered, when we are confident, mm. when our self-esteem is high. We make the best wives. And Tep, I would tell you that uh, having a woman who can take care of herself, it's, it's the most blessing here, especially us in business. When things are not running for months, even if you can't do anything, but she can cover bases, I'll tell, I'm telling you, I can tell you, it's a blessing. Because having to worry about yourself and having to worry about her, yeah. that she can't do even, she can't get the basics of the basics of things. Hey, man, I think it's a lot. It's overwhelming. Mm. Overwhelming and overbearing. Mm. So I think it's in everybody's interest for women to be self-reliant. Yeah. There needs to be something that you do really, really well that ensures that you are able to sustain yourself mm. and your family in the absence of that man. A lot of women are widows. You know, husbands die unexpectedly. You know, my father died unexpectedly. And imagine if my mom could not do anything for herself. Where would she be? Where would we be? And I would like to believe you were very close to your your dad. You know, uh, I was very close with my dad. Um, My dad was an open book. Mm. And if you hop into the car at any given time, you're going to learn 10,000 lessons, you know, life lessons. And... He was such a candid person. Nothing was off limits. You can ask him anything. You can ask my dad anything. And he was the kindest person I know. Mm. Mm. He was such a generous person. He was so well-spoken. He was so respectful of other people, very mindful of other people. But also he knew how to stand his ground. And people will tell you about his experience of him in the courtroom, whether mm. he was a judge or an attorney. And he was, you know, he was, he was vicious. But as his daughter, I only know him as my dad. And I think it was so empowering to have had such a parent. Mm. And I draw on him when things get tough. Uh, how did his passing on affect you? Sure. 2013 was the most difficult year of my life. The most difficult. And I think I'm tearing up because (laughs) my dad died. (laughs) And then I had a miscarriage. And then I developed kidney stones. Same year. In a space of three months. And I think the rift between my fiancé and and I happened during that time as well. So I think it's four catastrophic things that happened in my life. So my dad's passing made me grow up very quickly. I had to mature, sure, in a matter of six months, Mm. I had to grow up. And that's when things started happening as well in my professional life. And I can imagine, obviously, (coughs) he was a dynamic man and not easy to replace. But also, is your mom here? lost a partner and yeah. it's you, the older. 
it's like in a way you have to fill in some roles. You have yeah. to assure the family that, listen, let's go. We can, we can, we can do this thing. Sure, sure. My sister was in her final year of university, I believe, and my brother was in his first year of university when my dad passed. Mm. No, my sister was uh, had just started her first job when my mm. dad passed, and my father, my brother was doing his first year of uh, university. So everybody was at a, you know, sort of a crossroad, adjusting to that new life and now this. So it was it was overwhelming because I felt like I had to carry them, you know, for about five years. I would assume you um, also had that feeling that there was a lot to learn from him. Definitely, and you know, God works in such amazing ways. You you then realize. When you're confronted with a challenge, you realize that you have the solutions because you have been equipped in the Direct 30 years. Yes. yes, in the 30 years that you were alive. And I think we were blessed because my grandmother, his, his mom was still alive by then. Mm. And she was the voice of comfort and reason during that time. And uh, my eldest aunt, Morshadi, and mm. anybody who loves me, calls me Mugashadi because I'm named after her. Mm. Mugashadi was instrumental in my recovery. She's also a firstborn. Mm. Um, and I leaned on her for everything. Mm. Be it business, be it challenges in my relationship, you know, how to relate to my siblings and, you know, all of that. So there were anchors that were placed in my life to enable me to recover. Mm. and ensure that we overcome that big, big hurdle. Yeah. yeah. How far do you want to take this politics thing? How far how do you <coughs> envision yourself in this space? Like, <clears throat> obviously, I believe <coughs> every, active, every activist has, you know, wishes and vision in mind. Mm. Don't give me that story. Uh, no, <laughs> wherever they'll send me, I'm ready to serve. No, no. But how far do you want to take this? Uh, I love the diplomatic space. Mm -hmm. I love the diplomatic space. Mm. I love building friendships. Mm. You know, I love the traveling. Um, so, yeah, anywhere in that space where I must go and build friendships for us, I think I will do really, really well based on the skills that I've acquired over time. Yeah. So, you know, one day if I'm deployed, you know, to Portugal, I'll be the happiest. And I think you'll do well. Like, like I'm actually beginning to visualize it. Uh, <laughs> the way you're so equipped, open-minded as you are, uh, the way you can express yourself. You know, I wish I could express myself the way you do. I think you'll do well, especially managing relations, stakeholders and everything. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 I understand. And the current environment in politics right now, uh, how happy are you with your party, and if there are things that you wish would, like, maybe they're not going too well, they can be fixed. And because one thing that we must understand, the NC has done a lot, a lot of things. There are many victories that the NC has done. And I believe that if I can also argue that there's somewhere where the NC went wrong, I think I'll be able to put in one or two points there. And I feel that even you who's in the space, I think, if you're honest with me, there are things that you've seen. And also when you're sitting with your comrades, you say about, hey, comrades, more Um, <coughs> I really think we have not done enough to capacitate the people that we deploy. Hmm. When you go into a local government function, um, mm. a municipality, and you're a business person, and you, you need to be compliant, you know, you don't know all the bylaws, you don't know where to look for them. You, you know, you go then you say, look, I've just started a business, what do I need to know? The very person that is sitting with a mandate to empower you and support you and enable you doesn't have the foggiest idea of the environment that you work in. That's the first pitfall. We have not resourced our local government adequately. Hmm. And when you delve deeper into the issue, you look at budget allocations from a national level. 
municipalities are allocated 10% of the budget. The rest goes to um, government departments. And where the problems are at, it's local but municipalities. But our touch point is the municipality. So there's a misalignment of resources. But who is talking to this? Who is able to observe and say, but our problem is here? And what are they doing to effect the necessary changes? So I think it takes us too long to troubleshoot. And that's why we see the magnitude of challenges that we are sitting with. And that's why now you are checking, in filling these positions now, you are checking basic requirements. Requirements. Because the issue of constituency, I'll give an example. Let's say I'm unemployed. Yes, I'm unemployed right now. I've been unemployed for more than 20 years. Yeah. I have time. Then I start to mobilize my community members to rally behind me. Sure. I have time. I have, I'm just there. Yeah. Then I have constituency. Yeah. Constituency, they raise their hands, they nominate me. Yeah. Yeah. But I know nothing. Yeah. But I have people who back me. Yes. And voila, I'm the mayor. I'm overseeing a budget that must help people and I have no clue how yeah. things work. Yes. I think as you explain, you are saying those are the things, those are the pitfalls. Yeah that you should have looked at and maybe you are trying to rectify them right now. Absolutely. Mm. And also we need to, um, you know, civic duty, the people that raise their hands, what do they know about the person and what is required of that person once they're in office? Mm. We have not done enough to educate people on the ground. We don't have enough civic organizations educating people on civic duty. How many people do we know who have not registered to vote? And whose fault is that? Yo. I think we reserve leadership for those who have titles and are occupying certain offices. And constituents. We don't realize that we ourselves are leaders, even without the titles. So the onus is on us to conscientize, not only ourselves, but the people around us, so we can do better because we are responsible for those irresponsible decisions that we take of deploying wrong people. <laughs> we were misinformed. We were ill-advised. So this is a seed falling into sand. Sand mm -hmm. cannot support life. And we're the same ones who are going to go and burn down the building when we don't have services. We don't see our role in this. And I always, it always comes back to the issue of corruption. Mm. The people holding the biggest placards during a, a protest are behind that corruption. They are the ones who do the biggest corruption, but they don't own it. Right now, if you have a child who's unemployed at home, they went to university, they've got the degree, and you are mobilizing your friends to employ your child, and I don't know any job as long as I have a rec. That's it. And you expect your friends or whoever that you know to take your child and give them employment for a smaller nyana favor. Mm. That's corruption. We've worked with you, comrade. We supported you. Yeah. I came with a solid branch. <laughs> it's corruption, but we don't term it such. It's only corruption when it's 500 million of PPE. But when, today, if you need to renew your license at the traffic department, and how many go for the line? You go and give your neighbor who works co countering two hundred, so they process your things yeah, from pleased. the back. I'm is that is that is that corruption? Especially if you have driven without a driver's license. I mean, why would you stand on the truth? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> so it's you know. So our definition of corruption is mm. also warped. Mm. Mm. So we need to own some of these. Uh, m situations that we are in, you know, we, we enable them. <laughs> but it's only corruption when Tepo pays an official to get a tender. Mm. That's corruption. Marawena or regulating driver's license is not corruption. Mm. If we were to sit now with records and say, okay, who actually passed their driver's test or learner te learner's test? Mm. We're going to be sitting with a scandal where we need to recall 60-70% of license holders. Mm. How much because did you pay for your lenders? Yo, I failed three times. Mm. And the fourth time... 
You had to make a plan. <laughs> no, never. My father refused. Mm. My father refused. So I kept going until they passed me. And I learned it's, it's a difficult exam. No? And that thing is easy. But I'm mm. told, you know, they engineer it so that you just fail. As long as you have not seen them. Uh, that was the, the narrative then. I don't know. In my era, we, we had to study and understand it. Yes. And mm. you'd fail by one point every time. Mm. <laughs> so it's, um, it's, it's, it's one of those things that we, we need to, you know, put our foot down and say, no, we're not doing it. And if enough of us do that, we can turn the corner. Mm. But for as long as our definition of corruption is not aligned, then we're not going to stamp this thing out anytime soon. Mm. So yes, corruption is a problem. And at what level do we concede that it's corruption? When it suits us. Absolutely. Yeah. And so that means we are part of the problem. We must own it. So this accountability that we demand mm. from senior leaders needs to start at us at an individual level. Yeah, but it's complex. You know, I was, I was even analyzing the political sphere right now that for instance, in African areas like Bukhaute, the very same middle class that the ANC created, from nowhere, who now live in nice houses and what, what, are the ones who are saying, no, this thing is wrong for us. This, we, we can't tolerate this thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and you wonder, is it a, a, a memory, selective memory or what? But also someone put it bluntly. Uh, that the ANC is like that uncle that took you to school <laughs> but abused you. Yeah. <laughs> Paid for your fees but sexually molested you. So you are caught in between uh, and everything. But I believe that uh, maybe uh, the, the, the movement is blessed to have people like you who can raise these things and they must be raised without actually discrediting anyone. Because Absolutely. if you can see now, uh, where if it's losing a, a favor uh, or trust from other people, it's because of these little things. Because right now, NC should be polishing these things and moving. But because of these things, now you are dragged back. I think um, the ANC has got two dynamics. Mm. You know, you're trying to run the state and you are trying to run the party. And the dynamics are different in each environment. Mm. At the party level, um, to mitigate some of these challenges that we've highlighted, was to establish a school where each and every person who wants to understand the ANC must go through mm. the OR Tambo School of Leadership. Yes, yes. Now, how many of us have actually undergone those courses to understand this institution that we associate ourselves with? And, and, and you don't pay. It's free, that thing. I want to bring another dynamic there. That one thing that the NC suffers from mm. is not necessarily the NC. Mm. The administrators of government, mm. those with qualifications, are the one messing up. And it goes back to the NC. Barbatwali. Because there's a thin line between these deployments and uh, how other people get to get into the system. And when those administrators are not doing the right things, it hits the party. Like they had nothing to do with it. Not that uh, with other administrators, like maybe ANC doesn't put in hands and meddle and everything. But we have also a lot of percentage of administrators who are just doing their thing. And all we do is to blame the ANC. We're a broad church as the ANC, and I think we, we, we need to be mindful of that. Mm. There are all sorts in the ANC. And I think any leader will tell you that managing that is no easy feat. And it's up to us, leaders at all level, mm. whether you have a position or not, to hold each other and ourselves accountable. And it's this lack of accountability that leads to some of the situations. I think... There are narratives that we, we, we really, really need to be intentional about stamping out. The mm. fact that as professionals, you go to die in state-owned entities because of the influence of the ANC. Mm. That's a narrative that we really don't want. Mm. So we need to rein these kind of things in and understand that we're a broad church, so we attract any and every. Mm. 
and we are remedying the situation. Interventions like the OR uh, Tambo School. Cool. Yeah. You know, how many of us have undergone the training? Can yeah. you go there if you're not an ANC member? I'm not sure. I must yeah. actually investigate. It rules, it rules us out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I must I must actually find that out. Mm. And also as government employees, how many of us actually undergo the free courses at the at the school of government? And, and maybe it should be compulsory for the people you are deploying. It because is compulsory. They lose the, the DNA, right? It is compulsory. It's compulsory now. Yes, from the level of counselor, anybody, uh, any form of no, 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 I mean uh -huh. from the administrative part, the accounting yeah. officers. Ah. I think there must be another debate because you are putting someone who you say you deployed but doesn't have the DNA of Ouartam. Sure, sure. That person can easily mess things up for you, can build a bridge that costs 44 million and the bridge actually costs 5 million. The lack of consciousness. Doesn't have that DNA of Ouartam. Mm, the lack so of consciousness. maybe you should also look at that. But I think politics we can... Go a lot, you know. Uh, but a parting shot just on politics. I just want you to, I know you are a staunch ANC person. Just give us reasons why we should vote for the, vote for the ANC. Look at what the ANC has produced at its best and rekindle that. Excluding corruption. Look what the ANC has produced at its best. Yeah. And let's invest in the things that produce that crop of people. Wow. Wow. And I think that's the reason that we have faith in the ANC and we believe that we're the only ones that can ensure that South Africa truly transforms. Yes. I'm a product of the ANC Youth Lead. Mm. I learned to manage objections through door to door, mm. which is something I do in business all day, every day. And had I not undergone that training, I don't think I would be the businesswoman that I am. Mm. So there's a role that the ANC plays in ensuring that we have better equipped leaders for our needs in the future. And Seb, I want to come in, especially on the issue of door to door. Yeah. I was thinking about it and it actually annoyed me that why must door to door only be considered when you are going to elections. I think it's unfortunate that that's the misconception. Mm. Well, I've in, for, that, in my area, I only see for, them before elections. Yeah, that, that, that's, that, that's unfortunate. And I think also we have not given ourselves the task of mentorship as former ANC Youth League leaders. Mm. We believe that once you vacate office, you're out and you aspire to other things and you neglect the responsibility that you have to raise other leaders. Yes. Because for me, door-to-door -door doesn't stop. I am door-to-dooring throughout my life. Ah, it's Whether man. it's knocking it's at somebody's stops, door or, or, or in the parking lot or in the escalator it at the shopping It goes hand in mall. hand with the bulk printing of T-shirts and that happens once in five years. These are tactics. All I'm saying is that yeah. if you can work on that, mm. can you imagine after elections, you go very same door to door where you assist people to wash dishes and all sorts of things that you are doing. You still ask them, what should we do as a party? I think that's irresponsible. If that happens, it honestly is irresponsible. And we need to deal with people that perpetuate that kind of behavior. And if it does happen to you, call somebody. Tap you are them. washing the dishes? No, no. If, if somebody who came and washed your dishes in six weeks' time comes and asks you what your challenges are, mm. you no, know. No, no, not challenges. Yeah. You know, I'm not saying literally after elections. Yeah. All I'm saying, can you imagine how nice it would be mm. next year around this time? Yeah, we have the same. You are going door to door to say, are we on the mm. right track? Sure, sure. That thing, I think, will be able to even secure and uh, uh, key votes for you. Yeah. You'll never leave it because we are going to say, but... When you came here last year, this is what we wanted. Mm. This is what you said you'll do. What happened here? Then you explain. Yeah. Then you go back. Can you imagine if there's a political party with door to door every year? Uh, now I think Look, it was going to win this thing. In, in, in the Women's League, we have a concept, yeah, Tobela Marishan. 
And Tawela Mwavishani is that continuous door to door. And wherever there's a woman who ha- wears a green blouse and a black skirt, mm. she has a responsibility to continue door to door, even outside of election season. And those blouses look so good. Plus, is it compulsory you must wear a heel? <laughs> hey, they look so sexy. It's not compulsory to wear With a heel. With respect. <laughs> We don't have to wear the heels, but, you know, whatever is within your comfort. Mm. So now that we have a younger crop of, you know, uh, 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 Women's League uh, members, you know, the stilettos are coming Maybe out. Maybe I'm weird, but it's one of the sexiest things to see. To see all those blouses and yes. it's so beautiful. Tim. No, the sea of green is a formidable mm. force. And because we have relaunched the Women's League, yeah. the ANC is revived. Mm. And that's the special touch, the magic touch that women have. Kind of ANC doesn't have men's league, no? There's no men's league. My daughter, no ANC. No. <laughs> it's, been a, it's been a boys' party throughout. I'm just imagining <laughs> those uh, blazers say it's a yellow, no? Yeah. Say it's a gold. Yeah. <laughs> it's not bike, it's a gold. I don't know. It's just goes to my mind. No, but Go as you were saying, Sepo, um, uh, before I interrupted you, mm. uh, what you think can actually uh, encourage people to vote for this party? Yeah, mm. look, um, it really is about looking at where an organization is anchored. Mm. Challenges are there even in our marriages and our relationships. Mm. So the ANC cannot be absolved. Mm. And what we need are the minds to help manage and deal with those challenges. Mm. So it's not a them thing, it's an us thing. Draw in. Mm. Let's talk. Let's resolve these things. Yeah. It's a platform and a melting pot of ideas. Yes. And you've got to refine your skills so that you position your ideas to be better than those that existed prior mm. to yours. Mm, mm. So it really is where I come in as an image consultant to help polish you yes. and ensure that we elevate you so that your ideas actually get expressed. So don't sit with your ideas. Mm. We are where we are because the people with great ideas have opted to sit out of the game. So I'm saying, come. We're a broad church. Mm. There's room for everyone Mm. who is progressive. If you want to build this country, draw closer. Express your ideas. Let's implement them. Let's, Let's put them to the test. And I think that's what a branch is. A ground where ideas can be put to the test. Yeah. And when they work, they are able to be duplicated elsewhere. Yeah. And I think that's how I've grown in the organizations that I have served in. Tepo, you sound in DA, you know, in your articulation. <laughs> I think DA members, DNA then is going to say, can we poach this woman? No. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Black, green, and gold for life. Yeah, so yeah. Um, it really is. It really is about that, and we we must not sit with our ideas. We must not sit with our ideas. Mm, mm. We must really stand up and find platforms to express them. Yeah, and at the level of ANC, you've got a large, big platform where this idea of yours can then reach a bigger audience, and we can see this big elephant that is Africa turning around. So for me, it's about, you know, uniting the continent at Concord for Young Women. That's what we're doing. Mm. We are advocating for the continent to unite. We're advocating for young women to be economically active. And we're actually empowering them with the resources that we have so that they start their businesses. So we've got a footprint in SEDEC and we intend to grow it uh, it, uh, globally. Just Mm. next week, I'll be in Namibia. We'll be training young women on ICT and GOAT training. You're not campaigning. It's time to campaign when I'm busy with ICT. (laughs) It's part of the the activism. Everybody's got a role to play. So I am deployed in the space of young women, and um, that's the work that we're doing. And everywhere we go, we raise the flag of uh, the ANC very, very high. Closing the politics part, um, I hope some of these leaders of yours don't cross our minds when we go to the voting stations especially their behavior sure. outside. Tepo, the business person, the businesswoman that I know of. What are you working on? Uh, what's keeping you busy? What's exciting? What's, what's coming? What's happening? We're industrializing. 
we're industrializing. Um, the biscuits and the scones that you're eating was a business that was started with 300 rands and my stove at home. To demonstrate the point that you don't need 50,000 rand capital or 500,000 rand capital to start a business mm. that can be sustainable and thrive. Mm. I started this business with 300 rands in my social media account. And within 10, 15 minutes, I had sold out the first batch of biscuits and we have never stopped baking since. You just recycled the money and... 100%. So it was a proof of concept, uh, you know, to women to say, you know, you start where you are with what you have. Mm. It doesn't matter at uh, which level are you, you must use what you already have. We, are, we make the mistake of constantly acquiring new knowledge mm. and we never create a platform to apply it. I never went to confectionery, uh, pastry school. I'm no pastry chef. It's recipes that you grew up observing your family members baking. Mm. And you get a professional to refine it, and then you're able to uh, have it on a retailer's um, shelf. Mm. So I, I, I'm on a path to industrialize. We are playing in the steel space where we are fabricating. Um, I am involved in uh, property developments around the country, and I am uh, traveling the continent and uh, sharing uh, best practice for business people and uh, sharing ideas on how we can use our image to get ahead. So mm. I'm doing a lot of speaking engagements on uh, image and etiquette, mm. which is my passion. And uh, we're also manufacturing uh, soap. Mm. We're manufacturing uh, uh, dishwashing liquid. We're manufacturing uh, bleach, thick bleach. We're manufacturing uh, pine gel. And also, again, this is a proof of concept you know, for rural women, because you don't need electricity, you just need water for the products that I'm mentioning. Hmm. So we're trying it out and uh, we're going to scale the operation, incorporating, you know, women into the value chain and ensuring that everyone is uh, moving uh, with us. Yes. So, yeah, business, uh, it's there, it's in my blood and I'm always trying things, you know, this one fails, you try another one, this one fails, you try another one. And I'm still organizing events. Uh, I'll be at, uh, on a, you know, I, I select where I play. It's mainly in the CSI space. So I'm doing uh, events for a number of uh, global brands and I'm um, traveling the continent, you know, uh, doing those events. And uh, it's been so fulfilling because it's really touching lives mm -hmm. and impacting communities in a really, really positive manner. And my special focus now is rural development, really getting into the rural areas and reviving, um, you know, um, those nodes that were growth nodes in our um, in our in our rural communities because some of these projects have been abandoned. I believe, uh, Cappuccino, that we don't need to start new things. Mm. The people who came before us lay the foundation. Maybe now it's time to put up the wall plate, and whoever comes after me must put on the roof. And whoever comes after them must put in the window so that over time you are able to see the progress. Mm. So I'm not starting anything new. I'm just adding my voice to what has already been um, established. Yes. Um, so I think there's a lot of things. I can see time is moving like, uh, it's just moving like we, know, we haven't even done anything because <laughs> it is just flowing. There's so much to learn. I'm learning a lot. Um, this is one of the few interviews I feel so empowered uh, listening to you as you speak. And, and I want to thank you and appreciate that you came. This should be your home, just like door to door. Yeah. The year shouldn't pass <laughs> without you coming here to empower us. I think next time when you come, we'll actually look at a specific topic that you need to address so that we can make progress now. Now that we have introduced you to uh, the few Just Talk with DJ Cappuccino viewers. And I want to thank Mabutapa Productions, Tanzan and States. For the production, thank you very much for listening to Just Talk with DJ Capuchin. <laughs>